Our next speaker is Crystal Dombrow. Crystal worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for six years when she became interested in politics, inspired by a pelagic shark dive. She decided to transition into a career dedicated to marine conservation. Since coming to Scripps, she jumps at every opportunity to expand her education, studying lobbying, advocacy, volunteering at the NOAA labs, and even undertaking a micro MBA here at Scripps. The title of her presentation is, When the Predator Becomes Prey, a Framework for Shark Conservation in the Eastern Pacific Ocean Using Science, Economics, and Policy. Growing up, I was so afraid of sharks that I wouldn't go in the ocean. My dad was a fisherman, so we spent a lot of time on the water. A few years ago, I finally mustered up the courage to try surfing, but after only a few minutes, I had to run out of the water because I was shaking in terror. Then, a friend convinced me to finally get over my fear by snorkeling with sharks. So I did. But what I saw was completely unexpected. Instead of the mindless man-eating monsters that you hear about in horror movies, I saw peaceful creatures calmly swimming beside me. They would swim right up to me, make eye contact, and then swim away. They weren't interested in me as food. I then learned on that tour that some sharks are in danger of extinction. Sharks are vulnerable to fishing because a number of species mature late in life, they can get killed before they're able to give birth, and they only give birth to a few pups a year or every few years. Many species of shark act as top predators in their environment. If we remove too many of them from the ocean, theoretically, it could throw everything out of balance. Maybe even the ecosystem could collapse. I decided I needed to do something to help. So I applied to this graduate program. After taking classes in science, economics, and policy, I realized that they're all equally important to help protect sharks. But after doing an extensive literature review, I wasn't able to find anything that integrated all three perspectives in one place. So I decided to do that for my capstone. But it felt so overwhelming, I didn't know where to start. My committee suggested that I reach out to my professional network. I thought of one shark policy expert in particular. We got to meet at a scientific conference the year before. But I knew how busy she was, and I probably would have graduated by the time that we got to talk. But anyway, I decided that I'd put her name down on my to-do list. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw her walk past me. We were on the same flight. <laughs> I leapt out of my seat and ran after her. She asked me if I was also on my way to the Government Shark Conservation Workshop. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. The workshop happened to be held that week in the city I was going to, and it was open to the public. Dozens of international shark experts were there, and I got to meet with them. So in this unexpected way, my entire project came together. Even better, the workshop discussions perfectly set the stage for my capstone research. They were constructing an endangered species recovery plan in the United States for a shark that is likely to go extinct. But it's a type of shark that swims across entire oceans. So in order to protect it, countries would need to work together. Sometimes it's fished intentionally, but it's mostly caught unintentionally and thrown back at sea dead. And it can only be studied in the wild. For sharks in the open ocean, that's like trying to find a needle in a haystack except when you finally find that needle, it slips through your fingers, and before you can catch it, a gust of wind comes and blows the whole haystack away. Some sharks can be pretty tough to study. So you can imagine how hard it must be to figure out how to protect something that we don't know much about, and that a single country doesn't have full control over. All we know from science and fishing research is that fewer and fewer of some types of sharks are now in the ocean. But not all sharks are in such bad shape. Some are well-studied, abundant, and can give birth to dozens of sharks every year. Those can be fished in some areas of the world, and they likely won't go extinct. So the first part of my capstone was dedicated to finding out which sharks are in trouble and need help, and which ones are doing okay. The 
the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red List can help to answer those questions. It's an international group of scientists and other experts that investigates whether an animal is going extinct throughout the world. Currently, only about 16% of sharks are threatened with extinction, and that is the critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable categories that you see. About 31% of healthy, or least concern, 12% should be monitored closely because they could become in danger of extinction or near threatened. And we don't have enough information for 41% of species to determine if they might be going extinct or data deficient. The ones that are threatened with extinction or data deficient are the ones that we should be focusing on the most. It's also important to note that these assessments are a combination of global populations of each species of shark. While some species might be going extinct in one area of the world, they might not be in another area. For my capstone, I decided to narrow the focus to the Eastern Pacific Ocean. There are two main international governing bodies for fishing in that area, called regional fishery management organizations. The areas that they manage overlap in the middle, so laws from both organizations can help protect sharks in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. I'll now briefly describe some of the science, economics, and policy that I found in my research that could help make holistic shark conservation plans. First, there's science. Like the shark we discussed during that government workshop, the same amount of scientific information is missing for many species of sharks. But we can still pass laws to protect them even if we don't know everything about them. In my literature review and in discussions with experts, I found that a few key types of information can be gathered in order to see if shark populations are in danger of extinction. First, we need to know how old sharks are at different sizes. That way, we can ask fishermen to let go of any smaller sharks so that a new generation can survive into adulthood. We also want to know how many sharks fishermen are catching around the world. That includes high seas, coastal, and recreational fisheries combined. From this information, we can make sure that the amount and sizes of sharks fished from the ocean won't make them go extinct. Now let's get into economics. What you might not know is that shark is in a lot of products that you use on a daily basis and could be affecting them. So I have a few questions for all of you by a show of hands. Who here has a cat or a dog and buys their pet food from a store? Okay, that's a lot of you. <laughs> Does anyone wear lipstick or foundation? A good amount. And has anyone ever taken omega-3 fish oil supplements? A fair few. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but all of those products could have shark in them. Now, who here eats tuna? Poke, sushi? It's popular in San Diego. Fishing for tuna unintentionally catches sharks too. So as you can see, shark products are popular, though they aren't always obvious. Shark liver oil is what's commonly used, and it's called squalene or squalane. But there are plant forms of squalene and squalane available. So if you see either of those words on an ingredients list, make sure to check that it also says plant-based. Some countries do eat shark fins and meat, so people want to fish for them. It's an attractive business venture. In fact, sharks are an important source of protein for many parts of the world. But there are ways that we can inform consumers who have other options so that they can make a decision based on their ethical values. Some of you may have heard of Dolphin Safe Tuna. There are also labels for sharks for both food products and restaurants. A label can tell us if a shark was used in that product, or it can certify that no sharks were harmed during fishing. Also, substitution products can be made with imitation ingredients, kind of like eating veggie burgers instead of hamburgers. Finally, a full economic analysis of the costs and benefits of a law should be done before a new law is passed. This will let us know if the resulting law will actually help sharks. And last, there's policy. Policy creates, modifies, and enforces laws to make sure that sharks don't go extinct. A number of laws already exist through the regional fishery management organizations that I researched. These laws stop sharks from being targeted in tuna fishing. They also require that the entire shark is used if it is caught, so that none of it is wasted. 
Unfortunately, the popularity of shark fin soup throughout some Asian cultures has given birth to a type of fishing called shark finning. Fishermen will cut off the fins of a shark and throw the rest of the animal back at sea, wasting most of it that could otherwise have been used for food or other products. Often, the shark is still alive and ends up drowning. Luckily, this practice is illegal in both the United States and in the regional fishery management organizations that I researched. So if you want to help with all of this, what can you do? Most of the meetings that create these international laws can be attended by members of the public or by members of environmental groups. That means that we all have the power to help, but international meetings are usually held far away, are expensive to get to, and could use all of your vacation time. But luckily, we have a similar process here in the United States. Fishing is governed by regional bodies called fishery management councils. They each meet several times a year around the country, so an upcoming meeting may be near you. Here are the council regions and names. These meetings are open to the public, are free to attend, and public comment periods are sometimes held on nights and weekends. The public can ask the council to make sure that sharks were not harmed unintentionally during fishing. They can also ask that any shark fishing that does exist won't make those sharks go extinct. In conclusion, it's so important that when making these laws, both the economics and the science related to a single shark species should be included. Without putting these three pieces together, laws can entirely miss important aspects of how a shark is being used and how it, they need to be protected. After I did this research, I realized that combining science, economics, and policy actually forms a framework that can be used to create a new international treaty to conserve and manage the shark populations that are going extinct or that aren't yet protected by laws. Sharks have survived five mass extinctions over the past 400 million years. They've outlived dinosaurs and predate trees. And yet, ironically, after all this time, the only threat to sharks is humans. It's up to us if they survive. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. About shark relatives. Thank you for asking that. So in my study, I just narrowed the focus to sharks to make it something that I could actually accomplish within the 10-week time frame. But my main recommendation for this study is that if any new laws or treaty is made, that it be expanded to sharks, rays, skates, and chimeras, which are all a part of a group called chondrichthians. They're cartilage-based fishes. They usually have the same type of fishing pressure, are late to sexually mature, give birth to few young. So they experience a lot of the same problems. Any other questions? Yes. Do you, oh. Do you know if there, oh. <laughs> Do you know if there's any kind of oversight as far as the shark safe label? Like what's to stop a company from just slapping it on their food? So I looked that up. The website hasn't been updated in five years, so my guess is that that company isn't active anymore. But I wanted to mention it to maybe inspire somebody if they wanted to take up that initiative that we should definitely do it. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you.